of Acts, um, it's, it's called the uh, Acts of the Apostles, but I always thought it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that's in action throughout the whole book of Acts, a and not just in that time period, but always. He's, ever since Christ left and, and seated at the right hand of God, the Holy Spirit came and um, did the things that Christ wasn't that wasn't part of Christ's ministry. He, he's, he came to 
to expand it, to broaden it, you might say, because uh, Christ only, he was working with uh, maybe several thousand people in this small little area of the world, whereas, probably more than several thousand, whereas the Holy Spirit, he encompasses the world. Um, the last time I spoke, I talked about love and the gifts of the Spirit. In a nutshell, I said, um, I said, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, but not without love. And uh, I closed it with a statement from Paul where he said, let all that you do be done with love. Uh, some of my points were to not to love the giver of the gifts, but um, to, uh, excuse me, Love the gift. Uh, don't love the gifts, but love the giver of the gifts, and also the receivers. Uh, the receivers would be those who are um, the Holy Spirit has imparted these gifts on, or or the people that are receiving the benefit of those gifts. Um, so the message is really about love, and not so much about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, although they are very important. So I want just one thing. I just want to drive home here: the gifts are nothing without the Holy Spirit. And if the gifts are everything to you, and I'm going to say something a little strong that I don't want to offend anybody, but if the gifts are everything to you, your heart's in the wrong place, and you're in danger of hearing those words, I never knew you. If you don't know Jesus, you're missing out. And if anyone here really doesn't know Jesus, um, come talk to me afterwards, or come talk to Caleb, or Amy, or Bob, or... Someone you know that knows Jesus, and we'll, we'll help you. Get, I'll introduce you to him. So it seems to me that there's three persons involved in the gifts. And uh, Paul kind of makes that clear, at least in, in my eyes. This is the way I see it. And we, we talked a lot about 1 Corinthians 12 um, when we were talking about the gifts. And um, just read this little section here. It says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God, who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So, when Paul wrote this, he wrote the Spirit, and then the Lord, and then God. And so, I'm thinking, okay, the Holy Spirit's pretty obvious, so the Lord probably pertains to the Lord Jesus, and God is for God the Father. Typically, that's how it's, it's written in the New Testament. They'll call Jesus Lord. God, when they talk, call God, God, they're talking about God the Father. Um, he's one, he's three, but it's obvious that all three persons are involved in the gifts. They're, they were involved back then, and they're involved uh, heavily now in the gifts. Um, it's, we're talking about the Holy Spirit today, but it's not just Him that's heavily involved. Um, back then, um, Jesus came in the flesh with limitations. And, I mean, he came, basically it was, what did I say? Is there were limitations by choice. He stepped out of eternity into a body that was bound to die, and it wasn't gonna, it, well, he wasn't going to live a full life even. It was gonna, he was going to die on the cross. So there was a limitation there. He he, he stepped out of eternity into what we know as life. Um, he was not omnipotent. He was not um, omnipresent. He wasn't even all-powerful. Uh, and maybe you don't agree with me on this, but that's the way I see it. He wasn't all-powerful. He had to rely on the Holy Spirit. And so he taught us how to rely on the Holy Spirit, how to walk according to the Spirit. By, by he, he modeled it so we could pattern our lives in the same way. <clears throat> so Jesus came in the flesh with limitations. Um, he did the work of the Father and left to make way for the Holy Spirit to come and work with no limitation, without limitation. Uh, so you see all three at work there. Jesus did the work of the Father and the Holy Spirit came afterward. And they work in ways that we really can't understand or describe or explain, but we know that they're all three busy at work. 
So the Holy Spirit is doing a mighty work in us and through us, and in my opinion, we should uh, be humbly thankful for this because it's pretty amazing. And I'm going to talk about that more as we get into this. Um, the, once again, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, where you just hear a lot about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, it says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So I'm reading this book. I just found it a few weeks ago, and I, I got just caught up in it when I read the first chapter. It's A.T. Pearson is the person's name. I had never heard of him. He was born in the mid-1800s, and he lived into the early 1900. He wrote a number of books, and um, this book really caught my attention, and the name of the book is The Acts of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he said in there that, um, that grabbed me I want to find on here so I can read it and not have to look up there. But I've already lost my place. Okay, one true actor. One true actor or agent. Now, the actor, you notice capital letters. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. One true actor or agent is recognized. All other so-called actors or workers, then lowercase means he's not talking about the Holy Spirit or God. So that, that refers to... The, the church, the body of Christ, each and every individual. Um, also, other so-called actors or workers uh, being merely his instruments. And so, and then it just, he goes on to describe an agent being one who acts, an instrument being that through which he acts. So, you know, I, the question pops in my head, and maybe you're thinking the same thing. Are you okay with being an instrument? <clears throat> Doesn't it seem kind of like cold and impersonal? But his work, the Holy Spirit, is not cold. It's not a cold and personal thing. He's, uh, he's a kind and loving and wise person. And it's kind of, you know, when they say the Holy Spirit, you don't think of him as a person. You think of him as a it, like Bob had pointed out in one of his service. He, he's not an it. He's not a thing. He's a person. And he's kind and he's loving. And as I... As I walk through this, trying to put this message together, I met him in a new way. That was like, especially one morning in prayer, he was just like stirring in me. And it was like, he was impressing on me all the information I needed to know. And it got real personal and intimate between me and the Holy Spirit. You know, I've always stri- I always strive to be personal and intimate with Jesus and the Father, but I've never gone there that way with the Holy Spirit like I did that one morning. Um, he is a kind and loving and wise person. Um, but I want to say this. He's not a wimp. He's all-powerful. He's, on, he's, he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And, um, and he, loves, he loves like no one ever loved. He's a person. So the book in the Bible is called The Acts of the Apostle. It's a story really about the Holy Spirit at work in the early church. The early church, unhindered, was very receptive to his work in them and through them. And you read this when you, as you're reading in the book of Acts, it's like it it talks about from the very beginning, it talks about this early church and how fast they're growing. And just they are so devoted and dedicated to each other and to what the Holy Spirit is working, doing in them. Um, it's, It's a model that I wish we could see today in our church. Um... The Holy, same Holy Spirit, he hasn't changed. He's at work today, but generally speaking, today's church is not the same as the early church. Now, I'm saying generally speaking, because I'm not necessarily saying this church. I, I think we're, um, we're quite a few notches above the average church, church across the country. I think um, we're definitely not woke, <laughs> and there are some churches that are woke. We're definitely not worldly, and there are some churches that are worldly. I think uh, we've, we've learned a lot, and, and just watching this church respond to diversity and how we don't break up, we don't spread, we don't get divided, we pull together. That's, that's the um, indication of a very mature uh, group of believers. Um, but in general, today's church is not the same as the early church. It may be that the church today is, uh, is very comfortable in today's world. And I'll put my hand up first, because I am comfortable in, in this world. And I don't really want life to change from this comfortable place that I'm in. I kind of like having my cars and 
my boat to go play in and the real nice house that Amy has made very nice with her decorator abilities. There's, um, I like that. I, I'm comfortable. I, I don't want to get out of the comfort zone. But I think that's the problem is if, if the hammer came down and we were forced out of that comfort zone, um, well, maybe that would be a good thing. Maybe it would, it would cause us to change our priorities a little bit. But I'm not going to pray for it. Because <laughs> I think the church is missing out. And the second thing I wanted to put up here that um, Arthur Pearson had written in that book, The Acts of the Holy Spirit, he said, and this is to me really grabbed me. He said, what a power the Holy Spirit would be to the believer and to the church if allowed to work unhindered by disobedience, unbelief, worldliness, and carnality. Um, so he's talking about in the like, late 1800s when he wrote this book, The Church, you know, is not like the early churches. He's seeing this. He's seeing the, um, the big difference between today's church in the late 1800s and back when the early church started in that very beginning of the, of, uh, of the, when the calendar started going forward instead of backward, you might say. Huh? Um, and so if, he's ta- if he saw it then, how much more does this apply today? Uh, that we are hindered by disobedience, unbelief, worldliness, and carnality. So disobedience, we embrace the things of God that fit our lifestyle and reject the rest because we're not comfortable with the rest. It's not what we want, like. I don't like that part of the Bible, and so you reject that. But when you reject the things of God, the word, His Word, um, that's, that's really rebellion. And that could stir you up right now. Whoa, come on, I have the right to reject what I want. Well, God wrote every single word in the Bible to tell us how to live life to the fullest, to live a really good life. And when we, when we ignore that and we rebel against him, it breaks his heart because he wants us to live a full and good life. And so it's rebellion, rejecting the parts you don't like of the Bible does, does not lead to life. It leads to something somewhere else that causes you to just struggle. And you wonder, why does that Christian seem to have it all together and me, I'm struggling every day? Well, maybe you need to embrace everything that God has for you. Unbelief. You know, it's so easy to believe what's, what you see. We believe that seeing is believing. Missouri especially, show me. They're the show me state. Show me and I'll believe it. Um, um, so we have a hard time believing the unseen. And it might be because we don't really want to believe it. Because once again, it pushes out of our, that comfort zone. Um, worldliness. So um, renewal through the Holy Spirit is a way to shake off the world. But most have little to do with him. I, renewal. So we live in a world that we're constantly exposed to it. And it rubs off on us. And so... You need, we need to be renewed on a regular basis, continually. And that's why we have the Holy... Well, that's not the only reason why we have the Holy Spirit, but that's a great benefit of the Holy Spirit because He's there. He brings about renewal, renews the mind, renews the heart. Um, we need that all the time because otherwise, without that renewal, you, get, you, go, you gravitate real fast to the world and the ways of the world because it's so easy to fit in to the system of the world, you might say. And we're not supposed to be part of that. So carnality, uh, we rarely say no when our body says yes, okay? When, you're, when your body says yes to all that extra food and, and I have a hard time saying no and my body is crying out, I'm hungry! We, or, that, or when our body is kind of like desires something that we shouldn't be desiring after and we, if you don't tell it no, then you're, in, you're entering into carnality. You're becoming carnal. You know, like chili con carne. That means, that means it's chili with meat in it. With, and so carnal is talking about the flesh, in case you never knew that. So what should a person's life look like if unhindered and lovingly receptive to the Holy Spirit? Well, that's really the meat of what we want to talk about today. So the book of Acts holds the answer, and it should be a constant reminder and example of what an unhindered church looks like. 
Um, and so whenever I, whenever I point to the church, it's really easy to say, oh yeah, the church. That's where the problem is. But the church is made up of individuals. And so it's person by person. It's not that big group over there that, that uh, well, I'm not really part of that. I'm, it, it's each person that needs to take this to heart, not the church as a whole. Um, Paul set a great example for us to pattern our lives after. But some may see him as kind of a superman of sorts because, man, the things he did are pretty amazing. So, um, and maybe we think we could never pattern our life after him because he's way up here and we're down here. So how about if I just pick a regular Joe off the street instead of Paul to, talk, to look at how we should pattern our life? Well, Philip, he's a regular Joe off the street. Philip first shows up. He comes into the picture when the need arises in the early church. And uh, this is a mouthful here. Um, it said, then they summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, is it, desire, is it not desirable? Oh, wait, it was, excuse me. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, is it not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? This is the twelve apostles that said this. Therefore, brethren, seek out among you, so they're talking about all the rest of the group, uh, uh, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, who was a proselyte from Antioch, um, and then they set him before the apostles and they prayed, had prayed and laid, um, and laid their hands on him. So I wanna, I've got a few places here where I'm going to go off the topic for a minute because I like following um, rabbit trails sometime. <laughs> this, um, up to this chap verse, this passage here, I was really stuck on uh, that Philip the Apostle and Philip the Evangelist are the same person. I, I, I wanted to find the answer to that question and everywhere I looked, except for one place, said um, he's not the same person. They're not the same person. They're two different people. But they couldn't give a reason why. I couldn't find it anywhere, something so I could agree or disagree. They just said they aren't. And I thought, that's, I don't think so. I think they're the same person. And I went through that, thinking that way, until I came to this passage. And the thing that convinced me is these underlying parts here. So it's, first of all, it says, Then the twelve summon the multitude of the disciples. So we're talking two separate groups here. There's the twelve, the apostles, and then there's the, the multitude. All the other people are there, are there too. They're, they're disciples. They're all disciples, but they got the, the, the twelve apostles and then the rest. And so they're talking to each other. So within the twelve apostles, it becomes apparent that there's a Philip there within that group, and then there's a Philip also in the multitude of disciples. Uh, because it said they, uh, the, the apostles say to him, seek out from among you seven men, okay? All right, they don't say, and us too. Seek out from among us and you seven men. They're saying among you guys, because the 12 needed to pray and to fast and get into the word. So they're talking to this group that's totally separate from them. They said, seek out from among you seven men. And then, so we've got a Philip in one group and we've got a Philip in another group when you read this text. It's really obvious to me now. And I, I, I ha it changed me just like that. I'm hard to change when I say, okay, no. It's just one Philip all the way through. And then all of a sudden, oh, eye opener. So, um, and then the last thing that, you know, it said whom they set before the apostles. So once again, they had to be two separate groups and it had to be a Philip in one and a Philip in the other. So I'm a change man. But I digress. Let's go back to the message here. Um, it had to be such a rewarding time for Philip to be part of the work of the Holy Spirit, what the, the Holy Spirit was doing in the early church. His gifts, and I'm talking about the Holy Spirit's gifts, they were at work in the church, and the church was growing fast daily. When you read through that, those first few chapters, it's amazing how fast the church is growing. And then just an example of this, of the seven, they're talking about Stephen here. He is full of faith and power. He did great wonders and signs among the people. Well, 
I don't think it was just Stephen because when we read on, we read about Philip, he's doing the same things. So did he do it here? I don't know. Maybe it took a while for him to get into it and only Stephen was. But I don't think so. I think all seven. This is just, uh, uh, just demonstrates how all seven were. And so it seems like what a, it's a rewarding time to be involved in the work of the Holy Spirit like that. And I think we can be in that place too, even more than we are. Because I'm not saying we aren't, because we are, but I think um, there's more to be, there's more to come. So in that situation um, with the seven and with Stephen, there are enemies who were, who were cut to the heart with a seething rage over the growing church. They thought they were doing God a service by stoning Stephen. Now, I want, to, I want to go off on another rabbit trail here. Cut to the heart. It's interesting to me because in chapter 2 of Acts, Peter talks to this, this large group of people and he says words that are critical to them. And yet they received it. They were cut to the heart by the words of Peter and they received those words and they chose life. They said, what should we do? And Peter told them what to do and they came to Christ. And the church was number became, grew like 3,000 more because of that. So there was one kind of cut to the heart. It's the same kind of cut to the heart, but it's sort of what you do with it. It it's, it's, takes you off the fence. When you get cut to the heart, you can't sit on the fence anymore. You either, you're either for Christ or you're against him. You're not just lukewarm in the middle there. Like, well, I don't really know how I think about him. Okay, so the other time that men were cut to the heart is Stephen is talking to a group of men in chapter 7. And he says critical words to them. And they're cut to the heart, but their response was rage, and they chose death instead of life. And so they went and stoned um, Stephen. And like I was saying, they thought they were doing God a service by stoning Stephen. I mean, these are guys that were devout Jews, and they knew the, the Word of God, and they knew the way to God. And so th this, these guys are obviously doing the wrong thing here, and stoning is according to our law, and this guy is a blasphemer, so he deserves death. That's what they thought. But what they didn't know, well, they, little did they know they were actually doing God's service by scat scattering seeds of the gospel far and wide. That's what really happened, because when they stoned Stephen, there was, it was kind of an upheaval there, and things started, whoa, what's going on here? And people started getting like, we got to get out of here. So uh, Philip ended up in Samaria. And uh, here's a little about that. There, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Okay, that's what I mean. They did God a service by scattering the seeds of the gospel. Um, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles, which he did for, un uh, for unclean spirits, uh, crying with loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Okay, one more rabbit trail. <laughs> with one accord. Starting from the beginning of Acts to, this, to chapter 8 here, it's six times. It's actually seven, but one of them is when those, those men with the seething rage with one accord ran at Stephen. I'm not talking about that. There's six words talking about the church. Isn't it great to be with like-minded people and when you're in the right place, I'll say, because when you know Jesus, you're in the right place. And it's just awesome to be with like-minded people. And the fact that he puts that in there so many times with one accord, with one accord, with one accord. I'm not talking about a Honda here. So <laughs> it says to me that unity is extremely important to God. And Caleb preached on that a, a, a month or so ago on that, about unity. It was a real good message. So anyway, though, we see in here the unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice. There was, he, they were seeing miracles. Uh, uh, they, they were... They were, the demons were cast out and many were paralyzed and the lame were healed. So the Holy Spirit was in action. So what gifts do you see at work in this text? So I'm going to list the ones I, I saw in here. Evangelism, miracles, discerning of spirits, healing. So what gifts were at work there that we don't see in the text? Well, I, when I think about it, 
I think these had to be there for the others to happen. There had to be serving, and there had to be helps and mercy and leadership and teaching. All these things had to happen so the other gifts could be could manifest. Um, so are those these last gifts lesser than those first four? And I, I don't think so. Uh, every gift is essential for the Holy Spirit to accomplish His work. It's all important. Does, there's no gift that's like, wow, well, man, I wish I had to get the healing. All I got is like, like teaching. You know, <laughs> no, it's not like that. Oh, there is. I put a little sign on there to tell me go to the new page. I almost missed it. There's a little asterisk. When you see an asterisk, if I don't turn the page, hey, hey, you forgot to turn the page. Let me know, okay? So, when the work in Samaria is complete and, and uh, the Holy Spirit has another assignment for Philip, now I know Bob went through this, these same stories. I just got coming in with different information, different point of view. Um, so, again, another mouthful. Uh, now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. There, this is desert. So he rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethi the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, not Candace, but these, this eunuch, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he is reading Isaiah the prophet, which is really cool. Then the spirit uh, said to Philip, go and near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Okay. So the, the gifts I see at work in this, in this little body of text here is helps and wisdom and discernment. And maybe you'll find some other ones, but those, that's what I saw. But I want to, right now, does anyone know what the eunuch was reading? I, know I didn't open up my Bible. But I'll, I'll go ahead and put it up here. I mean, this is where it was in the Bible. It, and when, what the eunuch was reading, it said he was led as a lamb to slaughter and not as a sheep before his shears. Um, not this verse in it word for word, but it was basically, you know, he was in Isaiah 53. So remember this, okay? Isaiah 53, because I'm going to ask you about it later. We're going to have a little pop quiz, okay? So we'll come back to this later. Isaiah 53, got it? All right, so moving on. So the eunuch has answered Philip. I know, you guys, I hope you're not tired of this story. Every time I read it, I'm excited about it. And you've already had to hear it from Bob. More than once, I think, from Bob. Um, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does this prophet say uh, this? And of himself, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth. And that was the end right there. All you got to do is open your mouth. And the Holy Spirit will give you the words. And beginning at this, this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's some water. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit um, of the Lord caught Philip away. Now when Bob did this, he went, BANG! <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so he caught Philip away. So that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went away on his way rejoicing. I mean, this didn't like catch him off guard and put him off. No, he knew what was going on here, and this is good stuff. And he went away rejoicing. Uh, but Philip was found in Azotus. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'll call it that. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, which I think is where he settled down. Um, now, the, the Holy Spirit, and we see the Holy Spirit in action. What gifts you see at work in this text? Well, the things I saw are teaching, 
knowledge and wisdom, evangelism, miracles. Uh, you know, if you start from the book of Acts and go to the end, you're going to see every single gift of the Holy Spirit in action. So we just see little segments of it here and there as we read through it. So last we hear of Philip is much later in Acts at a point. It's after Luke had joined with Paul. Because I don't know if you've ever noticed in Acts. So Luke wrote the book of Acts. And at first he talks about they, they, they. And at one point he starts saying we, we, we. He joins them. And so at this point he's already joined up with Paul. And... Um, we find, and when they find Philip, they find him still clo uh, working closely with the Holy Spirit. And his four daughters are involved in this work. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, not of the twelve, but of the seven. And they stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters, talking about Philip, who prophesied, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So, we don't hear anything else about Philip after this, but you can be sure, and I don't know, maybe it was mentioned in Paul's letters a time or two, uh, but you can be sure he was submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit up to his very last breath on earth. So, if a regular Joe off the street can be used by the Holy Spirit, don't you think you can too? And probably most of you already know this. You say, yeah, I'm already, I'm already there. But maybe some of you aren't. And maybe this will inspire you to say, yeah, I, I don't have to live up to Paul. Man, he's, he's like way up here. I couldn't. So, all right, go with Philip. So, but there's more to this story. Can't stop there. It's, it gets, it's going to get a little more exciting now. I'm jazzed. So going back to Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian, um, there's one work, uh, gift at work here that's not easy to see. After I read this story many times, one day the Holy Spirit revealed an amazing part of it to me. I don't know how I put it together, but it came together, and I thought, whoa, that is really cool. Um, so as Paul Harvey used to say, I'm dating myself, and now for the rest of the story. Anyone know, remember Paul Harvey? Yes. Okay. Um, so we pick up at the point after Philip is whisked off from the baptism scene. And, uh, and as Bob pointed out, the Ethiopian had a long trip ahead of him. So here's the time for the pop quiz. Got two questions. One of them I reviewed with you. The other one, well, there's, really, there's a lot of answers to the question. I'm just looking for a particular answer. So here's my first question. Now, I want audience participation here, okay? What do you think he did during the long hours riding in his chariot, this Ethiopian, this eunuch? What do you think he did? I mean, he probably looked at the scenery and praised God. I don't think he did this because he seemed like a very industrious fellow. Anyone have some ideas? Continued reading. That's it. That's what I'm looking for. So some of that time must have been spent reading. So... Second pop quiz question. Does anyone know where he was in Isaiah when Philip met him? Whoa! Okay. All right, you guys. Yeah. You passed. You passed the test. Everyone gets 100% and an A. Uh, so there were no chapters in the scroll, but he was in the part that we know as Isaiah 53. All right. Time to turn the page. See that little asterisk there? Turn the page. Even though I'm not using it, I'm still turning the pages. <laughs> All right, so soon, soon um, he's going to get to the part in Isaiah where God has a little surprise waiting for him. He's in 53, right? And he's reading on, I'm sure he picked up where he left off. Because it's a scroll. You don't just flip through the pages in a scroll. You just read it cover to cover, right? So I'm sure he picked up right where he left off. And so let's read along with him here, okay? So, first of all, God says, a little later on in Isaiah, Don't let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly, utterly separated me from his people. And it's, okay, that had to get his attention right there. Because he's a foreigner. He's an Ethiopian. He had just spent time 
in Jerusalem, but he was a foreigner there, okay? And, but he has just recently joined himself to the Lord. So he's going, whoo, look at that. Isn't that interesting? I just, I'm a foreigner. I just joined myself to the Lord. Hmm, that's curious. So then he says, nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. And now he's going, wait a minute, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What's going on here? I'm a eunuch. I say that all the time. I can never have a wife, can't have kids. I'm a dry tree. I say it all the time. They wouldn't even let me in a temple, as Bob pointed out, because I was a eunuch. A dry tree. So this is really getting his attention now, guys. And then it says, For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant. And he's, he's becoming breathless now. He can't even breathe almost. Because these things apply to him. He's, that's where his heart is. He's, his heart is for the Lord now. He wants to do what the Lord says you should be doing. He wants to please the Lord. So he's breathless, okay? This is talking to me. I get it? So, moving on. Even to them, I will give in my house and with my walls a place and a name better than the sons and daughters, that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Okay, tell me that didn't knock the socks off this foreigner. Tell me that didn't speak loud and clear to the heart of this eunuch. I would have taken this as, you're talking to me, Lord. I know you are. God just told this man he would give him a place in his house, a name better than sons and daughters, those, those Jews who wouldn't let him go into the temple. They're the sons and daughters, right? A name better than them, an everlasting name, so his name is recorded, he's recorded in the Bible, and we don't know his name, but we know who he is, right? Yeah. Every, if I said eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, I bet everyone in here, out of context, would say, oh yeah, I know that guy, Philip met, met with him. I bet you would. So, but what the eunuch didn't know was this. The Holy Spirit was act, in action behind the scenes. So about 700 years earlier, God had his, this eunuch in mind when the Holy Spirit ins, inspired Isaiah to write these words for this time and this place. Maybe for other times and other places too. But right now we're talking about this place with this eunuch, the Ethiopian. All right? Isaiah had, had no idea of this when he wrote it. He just wrote it because he knew he was supposed to. Philip had no idea of this when he approached a chariot. He just approached a chariot because he knew he was supposed to. You and I had no idea prophecy at work was at work when we read this story. I didn't for a long time. You guys didn't know it, right? And we didn't see the connection when we read in Isaiah 56. How many times have I read that and I didn't see that connection? So, but the Holy Spirit knew. He was busy at work through all of this. So how many times has prophecy, prophecy played out like this unbeknownst to the receiver? We don't know. His, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We have no idea how many times this has happened. We don't even know how many times it's happened to, in us. How many times have we been that receiver? We don't have a clue, guys. How many times has the Holy Spirit been working in our lives, maybe not through the gifts, but other things, in many ways that we're unaware of? Well, I can think of probably, kind on one hand, maybe four times in my life where I know God spared my life. And that was back before I was a Christian. And I think he wanted me to be, come to this place. And I know he saved my life. But how many times has he saved my life that I don't know about? One minute delay and I didn't hit that intersection when that car went through the red light. I don't know about that. How do we, we don't know what God's doing, not really. We just kind of got, he just lets us in on a little bit here and there. So um, today, today there's many things we don't know. Someday we might know all these things. Paul alluded to that. He said, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. I think we're going to know a lot more than we might even look back and say, Oh, I see. I see what you're doing. I heard it once that um, life is like God is weaving a beautiful tapestry. And from his point of view, it's just turning out beautifully. 
but we're on the underside of the tapestry looking up. And when you see the bottom side of a beautiful rug, you see all the knots and the things hanging out, and it's like, well, that's not that pretty. But if you go, but when you see it on, from God's side, you're going to go, oh, Lord, what you did is beautiful. I think that's how it's going to work. So here's like my, my main point. How could you and I possibly play any higher part in God's work than to merely be the instrument in his hand? I mean, we don't know what he's doing, really. We just need to be submissive. So if we want to be part of the Holy Spirit in, in action, it may call for some untangling in our lives so we can separate ourselves from hindrances. You know, the... The disobedience, unbelief, worldliness, carnality. So how do you get to these things? I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. How do you, how do you get there? Well, where is the love focus? Where is the love in your life focus? It's, it's, um, First John really touches on this. Don't, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, these are the hindrances is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So today, and today, the Holy Spirit is in action. He's, he's right here, and He's right now. He's in action. Right in this room, He's in action. And let's be His instruments. Lovingly, obediently, unhindered. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So uh, I'll close in prayer while the, these guys come up. The Lord, we do, we want to be instruments in your hand. We know it's not cold and impersonal. We know everything you do in our lives is personal. Lord, impress this upon us. Speak to each and every one of our hearts individually where you know where we're at and how to receive this message and how to have it change our lives, Lord. Bless us in this. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.